you gotta tell us the threesome story. The ATM won't let me take more cash out. And so then I'm like, Jason, you totally embarrassed me from the hooker. Now she thinks we can't afford her. Like this is just all going wrong. So then I went to the mini bar and was like eating chips and like she was went down on Jason. Women are expected to do everything and be everything all I'm at once. I'm getting aggressive. Look, listen, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't make the rules here, all right? I cannot get into this podcast without asking you this question first. You got to tell us the threesome story. I know you've probably told it a hundred times, but you got to tell it for Michael and the audience. Um, We're getting right into this. This was so years it's so ago. I mean, I hope it's not too played out, but basically it was Jason's what was it? It was the first year we were married. It was his birthday. And I think I was just going through a lot, having, you know, kind of become a wife so quickly and being in this committed relationship. And part of me felt like, am I going to be fun ever again? Am I still exciting? What can I do that's different? What can I, what, what kind of birthday gift can I give him that, I don't know, raises an eyebrow? <laughs> <laughs> and so I decided, I was like, I'm going to like get a hooker. I'm going to hire a hooker. And so I was with, I was in LA. I mean, God, it's, it's so long since I've even thought about this. I was in LA and I called my friend, Chelsea Handler, who of course has access to everything, all sorts of contraband, including hookers. And, um, <laughs> I said, I need to find a girl that will like come over to the house and like have sex with us. And she's like, okay. She gave me the number of like this massage therapist and the massage therapist came over. And I remember like getting into lingerie and trying to be like really cute for her. And she was just so professional. It was like very offensive. Like how professional, like too professional. She was like, like talking about like her. my rotator cuff. And I was like, when does she like make a move on me? Nothing's happening. Um, and then she was talking about how like offensive it is that like people think that she would be a hooker and I'm just getting more and more pissed. And does your husband, is, is your husband there? Because he was downstairs. First I thought like that we would hook up and then like I could like call him in. You know, I don't know how I thought I'd play it. But anyway, she ends up like pitching us this pilot idea for Jason and the whole thing just gets <laughs> terrible. And I call Chelsea and I'm like, the girl like did not even make a move on me. She did not even try to have sex with us. And Chelsea's laughing and laughing. And she's like, well, that's weird because like she totally, you know, has had sex with other friends of mine. <laughs> and I'm just like, what's wrong with us? So then we were going to Vegas the next week. It was our friend's birthday. And I was determined to find a hooker in Vegas. So I, call, I was looking on this app. I hired this girl. She came over. She looked nothing like her picture. When she walked in, she's like, you know, she had said it was going to be $500. And I gave her the $500. And then she looked at me and she's like, well, that was just to walk in the door. It's going to be extra if you want me to do anything. And then I didn't have any more cash on me. So I'm like, Jason, well, we have to like, let's go to the ATM. Let's get more cash out. We'll come back. We'll be right back. Uh, and Jason didn't want to leave her there. So I had to stay with her while she was like, you know, scheduling her manicure <laughs> and not at all interested. And he goes downstairs. He's like, well, it won't work. The ATM won't let me take more cash out. And so then I'm like, Jason, you totally embarrassed me in front of the hooker. Now she thinks we can't afford her. Like, this is just all going wrong. Uh, and so we're like, can you take a rain check? Could you come back? And she's like, well, just call me if you guys get more money. So she leaves. With the and 500, though. With the 500 that I never door. saw again. Yeah. And then we call. So then we call another girl because Jason's like, I'm not even attracted to that girl. Like, she looks like, like a little Lily Pushin, like, you know, the little people that like tie you up, like in Gulliver's Travels. Look, let, let me tell you something here. Do you know she what I got? She was like, she, the picture, she was this glamazon. And when she came, she was literally like the size of this table. So he was just not going well. So then Jason ended up calling one of his friends who sent another girl over. When she got over, she, she's like, I'm not into girls. But like I could go home and get my toys and use them on you. And I'm like, I don't want you to use your toys. Why would I want her toys used on me? Like that was, it was just all bad. So then I went to the mini bar and was like eating chips. And like she was went down on Jason. And then she asked me if I wanted to go down on him. But like, why would I want to? That's why I'm paying her. Like, what would be the fucking Let me tell point? you what I Hold got on, Are my, you eating on. chips while you're, while you're. Yes. And then he like, was like, you, are you watching? Because he's like, this is not hot. Well, let me tell and, you what I got uh, for my first birthday when we were after we were married. I think I got a scrapbook of that she made of herself. So it was just a, a book of me true. to look That's not true. I <laughs> gave you, I gave you, I gave you a Hershey syrup situation. Yeah, once. but that, not for my birthday. No, this is 
that this was this I've is very, given you some good things this is for your far birthday. removed. Okay, well, uh, next time I'll take you to eat chips in Vegas while you get a blowjob from okay, someone perfect. that Thank you don't you. find attractive. Yeah, I need to make a scrapbook of like pictures of me that Jason can release in the event that I go missing, like pre-approved photos. Cute. So that he's not choosing them because oh, he would. The, I know. Can you imagine? Should, no. any, can you even imagine any the photos photo your on my husband's release? phone needs to be burned and yeah, destroyed? This, it's disgusting. He'll, like send me a photo. I'm like. How did you even get that angle? Like, how like, is this even like, <laughs> what position were you in? Like the worst light I've ever <laughs> seen. Like, my nose. Like, yes. I've never seen anything like that. I agree. Okay, so you're eating chips. Yeah. Watching her go down on your husband at yeah. the same room, or you're downstairs? No, I was just there with them. Okay, so is that weird to watch another boring. girl go down on your husband, or is it kind of hot? No, it was like boring. I mean, it wasn't as exciting <laughs> as I wanted it to be. Uh, I know. Because yeah, in your she's mind, like, you do think you, it's exciting. Do you think yeah. the chips distracted from the situation? And then situation? she's like, do you want to eat me out? And I'm like, no, I'm eating these now. It's too late. Like, no. Yeah, the ch- I feel like the chips are what maybe threw everything off. Because I, mean, I would find that very distracting. it was thrown from the beginning, I think. Like, truly was not a good idea on my part. I could have, like, I should have been, like, taken, like, a more, like, sexual approach. But I was just then, like... In the business of like, can I ask you making one the caper happen. very important detail? Yes. What kind of chips were they? Oh my god, they were like you know kettle chips, the ones that come in every mini bar. So he's sitting there <laughs> getting blown, and you're just like crunch because kettle chips are crunchy as hell. So you yeah. just say, oh, I don't know. Yeah. I Wait, know. so did he like it or no? Is he no? Like- he was just like, why did this happen to me? <laughs> so if you were to go, if someone's listening and they want to plan a threesome for their significant other, the, yeah. the takeaway is that like you really, you really have to plan it. Like you have to you plan every really second. You really need to plan it out, and you need to know that the girl. See, like, I was very offended. I was like, why would you want to hook up with him and not me? Like, then I got into a competitive thing with my husband, whereas, like, I felt like I was really bringing something to the table for her, and <laughs> she did not. I would, I, that's how I would feel, too. <laughs> I mean, I was so offended. So it was hard. So what's the goodbye like? She told us some stories of other people that she had worked with, and those were interesting. And then the goodbye was just sort of a... Yeah, she took her money and and left. I wonder if she's still in the business. Isn't that breaking patient confidentiality? She's allowed to just like blab on about people. Oh my god, she told us everything. Um, what, what do you think she's saying about you guys now? She's like, listen, she, they're I'm they're sure she's chips, like, I'm in a book were, now. Yeah. <laughs> These fucking idiots. Now we're talking about a podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. as your Instagram grows and grows, she's like, shit, I should have hooked up with her. Wrong yeah. choice. No, my Instagram is just all like to make her fall in love with me. It's like. <laughs> Really, you're missing this. Since that birthday <laughs> gift, what have you given your husband that's been special? <laughs> How do you oh top that? Oh my God. Now, for his birthdays. No, now we just like take trips, like eating trips. He likes to eat. So we go we go places to try different foods. Your kids like to eat too. Yes. They, one more than the other, but yes. You have like, you guys have to go see her Instagram, Dictator Lunch. Dictator lunches or dictator lunch? Yeah, dictator lunches. Okay, how did you like come up with this idea? Because it's genius. Because they really are dictators. They don't eat anything. No. I'll make a five course, not really, but like my kind of five course meal. Yes. And she doesn't eat it. Yeah, totally. I know. Like, what do I you know. do? Well, you know, it started with just like I was just trying to entertain myself when I would send him to school with, you know, you had to send lunch to school with the kids uh, when they were in preschool. And I felt like, you know, how you pair, how you are as a parent is always just kind of a reaction to like whatever kind of parent you had. And since like, I didn't really have parents, <laughs> I feel like I'm making up for that with like, I needed to send them with these movable feasts. It couldn't just be a PB and J and like a bag of carrots. I wanted to just like give them this bounty because it was sort of for me, a way of sublimating my own guilt, being a working mom. It was a way for me to like have constancy with them, even when I wasn't around and like a dialogue almost. So they would open the box and be entertained and feel, you know, kind of that I was with them even when I couldn't be. And it started off where I would just, I would send 
I don't know, like, you know, I, I sent like a Chinese bao bun and then instructions for the teacher on how to like re-steam it in her microwave. <laughs> and they kept getting more and more pissed off. But like the thing with me is like then when people get mad, it really just encourages me to go further. <laughs> so then I was like, oh, really? She thought that was fucked up. Then I'm going to send fondue with like a little like, you know, little skewers and, and meats and cheeses and little bread pieces. And she has to like reheat the cheese for him. Uh, and yeah, I yeah. Just, the other day for sending too many sliced strawberries. Yeah, so what, she, not, is you know. the teacher yelling at you? Oh, yeah, I, would, I was brought in. And they told me I couldn't send the pit in the avocado, that they didn't want to take the pit out. And I was like, how hard is that? You should have sent it live chicken. I really should have sent, like, a, honestly, like a lobster tank, and they have to take the lobster out. <laughs> that would have been amazing. <laughs> so so let's. I want to go back with you for a second, because we were talking a little off air before, you, yeah. before we started the show. Yeah. And you just alluded to it. You, basically saying you didn't have parents. I want to understand how you grew up because you said your sister was basically where we grew up in San Diego. Yes. And you were in Arizona. What was yes. your childhood like? My childhood was like, did you ever see the movie Mermaids with Cher? Yeah, I love that movie. <laughs> that was my childhood. Now, I, I can't more, remember I, I the childhood. Context. Yeah, I basically had a mom that like was my kid who, you know, at 12 told me I came back from um, – being, a, uh, you know, at like an aunt's house for the summer and she was living on some guy's boat. And she's like, you know, I don't really know how to be a mom anymore. So you need to go live with your dad. So at 12, we went to live with my dad and then my sister, you know, didn't want to stay there. So we moved back to my mom's for a year and then she sent us back to my dad's. And I, you know, I'd always been bopping around because my mom would get married over and over again to different people and we'd live in different states and houses and what have you. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I just realized, I think <laughs> at some point it dawned on me that like, if I ever wanted to go to a good college, I sort of needed to be in the same school for more than a year. Uh, and I decided to stay with my dad when my sister went back. So when your mom's marrying all these different guys, did you meet all of these different characters? Are they nice? Yes. Uh, yeah. You know, it's weird. I'm always, I was just saying to Sylvia on the way here, we drove past this spa, like where I was actually like molested before the pandemic. It's a long oh, story. Jesus. It's not a big deal. Cause I was 40 guys. It's not like the biggest deal, but, um, I was like, I can't believe I made it to 40. Like that's kind of crazy, but it just shows you that no woman is safe in the world. But the fact that I made it to 40 with the childhood that I had is fucking crazy because there was no safety. There was nobody watching. There was no nothing. It like, was just, just chaos. Like, chaos, 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 like, chaos. There's no supervision whatsoever. No. And we were like brought to bars. I mean, it's just like, was all really insane. And was your dad a stable character? My dad's stable. Yeah. My dad's like a, you know, I, he's a, like a workaholic. Definitely. Um, yeah. More stable than my mom for sure. For sure. But, uh, she, I mean, she's my muse. Like she provided me with amazing content, but it was not like a maternal, there was no maternal. Like when I had kids, it was weird. You know, I almost had to like check myself because this idea of like, oh wait, he wants me to like kiss him before I leave the house. It wasn't that I didn't want to kiss him. It was that like, it didn't occur to me. You know, I had to, my son has taught me so much about, um, you know, just attachment in general because I didn't ha have that. And I think that like my second book is really all about this idea of like, how could I be the mom I always wanted when I didn't have the mom I always wanted? So stepping into that role is just crazy when you have mommy issues. I also think that that when you do have a chaotic childhood and like you said, you become a mom, the child does sort of, like you said, have to teach you what to do. Yes. It's a weird dynamic when you go yeah. on Instagram and you see all these mothers that are so maternal and it's so natural. Yeah, and right. It's so this and then you're like, wait, I've kind of had to learn this as I go. Yes. And sometimes it could take two years. I yeah. mean, more. Like, yeah. Well, I don't even know that they know. I just think that the performance online is another interesting situation because there you have, it's almost like we are allowed to almost create the mythology of our own motherhood. Right. So you almost use it as like a Pinterest board where you're like, look, I checked off all the box. I have the picture of my son in the pumpkin patch. I have the picture of the birthday party with the cake I made. I'm winning. I'm not my mom. I'm doing it right. And it's, so it's like it, it, it almost, it soothes you in a way, but you can't help, but then, you know, compare yourself and hold your motherhood up against other people's motherhood and feel like, 
you know, simultaneously superior and inadequate at the same time. I mean, it's a mind fuck. It's a mind fuck. And it's Mm -hmm. also constant guilt. If there's one thing in my life right now that I can't possibly live without, you think I'm going to say my wife, you think I'm going to say my kids? No, it's Athletic Greens, better known as AG1. This has become an absolute staple in my health routine. Right now, Lauren and I are in LA. We're batching a bunch of episodes, recording, catching up with the team here at Dear Media in the West Hollywood office. And the first thing I packed before my underwear, before my socks, before my shoes was my travel packs of Athletic Greens. Here's the thing. We've been talking about this forever. It is such a crucial staple in my health routine. Now I wake up every morning, have a big glass of water, dump a bunch of Athletic Greens in there. We have the travel packs. We have the big bags. We have this stuff everywhere. And here's the reason why I love it so much. If you want to get all your daily nutritional value, all your vitamins, all your nutrients, all your greens, your adaptogens, your prebiotic, your postbiotic, all in one place in one scoop, it's Athletic Greens. It gives you the most bang for your buck when you're talking about supplements. And we talk about a lot of them on the show. We obviously take a lot of others, but this is the one that I have to start with every single day. If you're new to supplements, if you're thinking about tapping your toe into that water and saying, hey, let me try something new. Athletic Greens is the best place to start because you're going to get such a well-rounded dose of all the things I mentioned previously. It's all clean ingredients, vegan, non-GMO, no sugars, no artificial sweeteners, all that great stuff. And it's made with 75 super high quality vitamins, minerals, and whole food source ingredients that deliver benefits like mood, immune system, and sleep support, sustained energy, and so much more. So check it out. If you want to take ownership of your health, today is a good time to start. Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to Athletic athleticgreens.com slash skinny. That's athleticgreens.com slash skinny. Check it out. Athleticgreens.com slash skinny. Lauren and I are always trying to share what we do for our health, what we do for our supplements, what we do for our workout routines, how we take care of ourselves, what we're eating, all those things. We try to bring experts on this show to talk to you about what you can do for yourself as well. One thing that often gets overlooked and people don't think about is not only what you're feeding yourself, but what you're feeding your kids. Also, what kind of supplements and vitamins you're giving your kids. That's why we love Haya Health so much. In our house, every morning when we wake up, we take our supplements as a family. I look at Zaza and I say, only you know which color do you want? And she either picks pink, green, or yellow. That's because she knows it's her high health vitamins that she takes every single day. Typical children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise, filled with two teaspoons of sugar, unhealthy chemicals, and other gummy junk growing kids should never eat. That's why Haya was created the pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin. Like I said, we're constantly looking about ingredients that we feed ourselves, what supplements we take for ourselves, but we're not thinking about our children. While most children's vitamins are filled with five grams of sugar and can contribute to a variety of health issues, Haya is made with zero sugar, zero gummy junk, yet it tastes great and it's perfect for picky eaters. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. It's non-GMO, vegan, dairy-free, allergy-free, gelatin-free, nut-free, and everything else you can imagine. It also includes a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies. They're supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, all the things that we need for energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones to keep our children growing healthy and feeling great. So definitely check Haya out for your little ones. We've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, you must go to HayaHealth.com skinny. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H.com skinny and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. HayaHealth.com slash skinny. Let's be honest. I am not the best cook in the world. I mean, I'm trying, okay? So enter HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients. And this is delivered right to your door. So I get my box. I don't have to go to the grocery store. And I can actually learn to cook in an efficient way that saves me time. I personally, out of all the things, am obsessed with their fresh pineapple chicken tacos. I gave these to Zaza. They were a hit. Michael liked them. Michael's really picky too, which is one of the reasons why I'm not like always in the kitchen because he's so picky. But with HelloFresh, he's obsessed because he knows what he's getting. They have 40 recipes and over 100 seasonal and convenient items to choose from each week. There's so much variety. So if you don't like to eat a lot of meat, that's fine. They got you covered. I personally am a big fan of meat, which is why I love the fresh pineapple chicken tacos. And the pineapple and the chicken together are just the best taste. It's like a party in your mouth. You should also know that HelloFresh is not just for dinner. So they have you covered for every mealtime occasion. They have like snacks, easy lunches. They even have seasonal celebrations and festive gatherings. 
this is really, really ideal for someone who's busy or someone who is not the best in the kitchen because of these pre-portioned ingredients. And you get to skip the checkout lines. And ultimately, it just saves you time. You're going to go to HelloFresh.com slash Skinny50 and use code Skinny50 for 50% off. Plus, your first box ships free. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Skinny50 and use code Skinny50 for 50% off. And your first box ships free. I am all about this. 50% off is such a generous code. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Skinny50. I yeah, feel constant guilt, constant guilt. Yes, like, I feel and, and I work like you like, yeah, I, if I don't work, I would be miserable. Yes, I would me be too. miserable not to work. Yes. So I work, but then I feel guilty that I work. Yes. And then when I'm home and I have to be on my phone, I feel guilty on my phone. And well, then did when you I, have a parent that worked? Were your parents both working? Both my parents were working. So I had this conversation with Katie Kirk where I said to her, I was like, how did you feel always having to be like, you know, she's reporting on 9-11. She's always like in it. Like, how did you feel as a mom? And she, I said, did you feel guilty? She's like, no, I didn't feel, what do you mean? I didn't feel guilty. And it, that's when the moment it dawned on me that like, oh my God, it's so different for our generation because we are also the product of moms who worked. So it's like, we, we want all of these things. We have all of this ambition, but we're also, we have the trauma of a, of a kid whose mom always worked. So we're, we're so torn. We're constantly feeling guilt. Every choice we make is, is you know, in favor of one thing over the other. And I think that's just so hard. But what do you do? I think about this all the time. I'm like, he, and I ask him, I go, do you feel guilt? Yeah, and he no. goes, no. no. He doesn't feel guilt. No. I'm like, you don't feel guilt that we have to, like, like leave and we can't be home to put her to bed? No, yeah. he doesn't feel guilt. Well, well yeah, because a dad that shows up at all is, like, lauded and praised. And they're like, what? You were able to put your kid to bed? <laughs> you bathed your child? You know, it's like you're a superhero. But if you're a mom, it's just like well, there's that I double standard. Well, but I also look at it as like, okay, well, like – I don't feel guilty because we're working and like that's why they're living in like the house, right? You right. know, like we I I don't see the option to to not. But here's my thing, which is so wild. Everyone says to me, Oh, do you have help? Do you have a nanny? Yeah. No one says that to him. And we right. work the exact same amount. How does that work? We work yeah. the exact same amount and yeah. no one says that to him. I they would ask say me, though, Lauren, it is yes. mostly women do they that think are saying that. that, that I'm to an you. octopus and hold I can- on, hold on. It's mostly women saying that to you. I don't know any of my I, friends that I'm have said. I'm fine if people ask me that, but it's the fact that no one ever asks the mm-hmm. male. No, ever. never, never, because women are expected to do everything and be everything all I'm at once. Ba- I'm getting aggressive. Look, listen, yeah. I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't make the rules here. All right, I just kind of go by and you know. So now, with your mother and your father, are you able to step back and see a different perspective? Do you still? feel like you have some sort of resentment towards them? What is that relationship like now? And does your sister have the same relationship that you have or is it a different perspective? My sister, I think, yeah, like I think you're never the same parent. You're never the same parent to two children. Like you're, she had a different experience of my mother than I did. Um, I think I detached at a younger age and probably just like um, coped with it in a different way. My sister, I think, feels more protective and an obligation to take care of my mom. But I think that for me, it's like there is, and you guys are catching me. I just came off of two hours worth of couples therapy. So it's like, I'm really raw right now. Come on, come on down. Really raw right now. Perfect podcast. But but it's this idea with me that the, the anger for me, I think comes from feeling like I don't want to even tell you what I, about my injury because in telling you my injury, you get injured and now I have to take care of you again. Like that's what, what do I don't mean? like. What do you mean? Say that, explain that again. So it's like, I think when you tell, telling your parent the injury, I think you when you tell a narcissist that like they've hurt you, they're instantly wounded. And then you find yourself in that codependent dance of having to take care of their injury instead of ever getting your own need met. Whoa. So it's fucked up. And also the defensiveness of a narcissist almost makes it not worth it because it sucks your energy so bad that you have no energy for anything else for the rest of the week. Well, yeah, it's like, you know, feed me and I'll feed you. Yeah. Yeah. And let me take your clothes and your food and cut your hair off and throw you in the gutter. Totally. So looking back on your childhood. But Instagram is also such a narcissist because it's like – if you want yeah. the light shined on you, then you need to keep feeding me. <laughs> and if you stop feeding me, then the light goes out. And there is nothing better than having a narcissist 
shine their light on you. You're right. You're right. We had someone on this podcast that like really dissected narcissists and they said, I said, what do you do if you have one in your She's family a psychotherapist. or a friend? Your whole practice is studying narcissists. That's and one, oh, no, wow. one of them said, you put them on stage. Oh, interesting. That's all you do. You put them on stage. Don't yeah. try to. Never yeah. going to get through. There's nothing you can do, they said. Well, Shamu will like pull you down by the brain. If you don't just keep feeding Shamu fish, it's like you're going to be the trainer that gets like taken under. <laughs> so you have to just keep giving them what they want. They say and it was then bad or sated. completely detach. There was like no. Other- or detach, yeah. It seems like though you've made a purposeful effort to separate your childhood from being a mother to me. It seems like you've done a lot of work. Yes. I mean, I've done a lot of work um, on. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely not. I'm a different type of parent for sure. For sure. So how do you do that? And I'm curious for my own my own uh life actually. Like how do you separate your childhood? Well, I think we all sort of project onto our kids and you're like, "Oh my god, they're going to have this issue and that issue and and um yeah, it's just different. They're living they have such you know, for, first of all, like Jason is such a different co-parent than, you know, I mean, I, I, the the dynamic in our house is just drastically different than the dynamic I grew up with. Um, and I think that you, as long as you're self-reflective and you're like looking at yourself and your part and like your triggers, I think that you inevitably become a different parent. You know, I, I think that why I did dictator lunches was because I was trying to almost give myself this corrective experience, right? Like it wasn't that Sid wanted these fancy lunches. It was more that I was like, this is what I always wanted. And the fact that he doesn't give a shit about them kind of means that I won, (laughs) you know? You're very, very self-aware and you're very self-aware in your books. Have you always been like that? Or is that something that's developed over time? No, I think I've always been forced to have to like kind of look at my part in things, you know? I yeah. don't like comedy where somebody isn't like t- taking the biggest like uh jabs at themselves. You're self-deprecating. Yeah, and I think you I think that's the my favorite type of comedy. It's relatable. Yeah, and I also just like I, I want to be vulnerable. Otherwise there's like no point. Who's funnier, you or Jason? I think that I am. I think that you are. Too. I think that you are too. I don't know if he would agree with me, but sorry, he would hearing me say that. <laughs> you mentioned couples therapy. Do you recommend that to everyone? Is that something? Yes. Tell me about that. Well, we've been in therapy Love since a little before we met. You could talk to him. Oh yeah, since before we, since yeah. before, before we, we, but since before, no, <laughs> since before we met, since we before we. We're married. And when, and, Take okay, notes, Michael. For context, Couples. how when did you guys meet and how? We did a movie together, and we were. It was in two thousand seven. Okay. And um, we were in therapy before we were even married. Yeah, right away, and we were married within nine months of knowing each other. Wow. So it all happened very fast. And when you go to therapy before you're married, is the problems totally different? That not I don't even want to say problems. Is the talking points different now? No. It's the That's same the funniest points. thing. No, it's like you're in your defenses. I'm in mine. Like you're you 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 think I'm your mother. I think you're my mother. Like I'm dealing with family of origin shit, but you're taking it personally because you feel like I'm saying that you're wrong or you're bad and that's your trigger. And so it just like it ping pongs back and forth. And does he have a similar or different upbringing? Different, but we were both like the codependent in our homes. Okay. So different, definitely different. So when you got when you guys are in therapy together, are there main themes or issues that you're both coming to the table trying to solve or is it just like hey, we want to talk about everything yes. that's going on in our life? Yes, and I think that we're so similar. But and the, the the biggest issue for us is like whose issue comes first? Whose dime is it? Is it J- you know, like I'm upset, I'm wounded because Jason wasn't listening to something I said. Oh, and then they I never listen. And then I come to him and say, I'm mad you weren't listening to me. And then he feels like, what did I do wrong? I wasn't even trying, you know, and it's like who's going to go first? Do you need it to be about you right now? If you need it to be, if you need this one to be about you, let's make it about you. We woke up this <laughs> morning in the hotel. Or do you need it, or can I make it about me? And I still don't know what she was upset about. I just know that I was ripped out of bed and the curtains were ripped open. <laughs> and I still, and I, I have never, no I idea like what to it keep it guessing. And you I said know. to her, I said, is this something you're doing because like you just need, like you just, you, you're, you want to like spice things up right now because we don't have the kids around us? Or, is oh, it, or did funny. I actually do something? I just like to keep it like guessing. Like, I don't like to keep it, like, too predictable. Well, I think it's difficult because as a man, I think we're not as good at reading 
emotional cues. You don't say. <laughs> you don't fucking and then say. that can I imagine could be frustrating because you're like, hey, I'm putting the signal out there. But to me, it's like you right. might as well be speaking Chinese. You guys are right? bad listeners. But though. even when we say I'm hurt, it's still sometimes hard to not hear it as you're bad. Yeah. Of course. But if so I say the same tricky. thing, if I'm I'm yeah, I think it's both ways though. Yeah. Right? No. Yeah. And then you're like in a lock. Yeah. But one of you has to sidestep it and be like, I can make it about you right now. I don't need this. I know that when you're talking, you're talking about you. And when I'm talking, I'm only talking about me. So <laughs> wait, that's I think the hard I might have thing. something to solve this. Why can't you go first in one session and then he goes first in the other session? Because when you're in conflict, it's like it's so hard to see that it's like not about you that you feel like, oh my God, this person's pissed off at me and they're coming to me and they're mad and, and I've done something wrong. And so you get into this dance of like, wait, if, I, if you just understood where I was coming from, if I can just explain myself and it's like, then you've taken the bait. Who it's gets to late. choose the therapist? Is it a joint effort? Beth was recommended to us. I don't even know how we met Beth. I'm not sure. Does she take sides? Uh, sometimes when she needs to, she's so good. If you guys are looking for someone, she's fucking great. I'm going to make you fly to New York every single time I need therapy. She's in LA. We do it. We do it on zoom. Oh, you do it on zoom. Mm -hmm. Is that as effective? Couples is, is effective on zoom. Yeah. So are you guys sitting next to each other on the bed? Yeah. And can you like pinch him if he annoys you? Yeah. (laughs) For for sure. Does it work? Yeah. I, I mean, Yes. So like yes. if you have an issue that you want to address, do you write it down in your notes app <laughs> and like save it for later? Sometimes. But then I always find that like when I reread it, it does sound, it makes, it's more incriminating. I sound like the psycho. That's very Abe Lincoln. He used to be angry and write his letters and then put them in a drawer and then not send them because the point is, is like, <laughs> it's like, like, you look, you look, I, you're like, oh shit, maybe like I, it's right, better I didn't send that thing. Right. Exactly. So you will, you'll go back and you look at the notes and you're like, hey, this is, I could let this one go. Or we'll like t- have like a texting fight after a fight and then we'll be referencing that. And it's like, let's just see. Wait, what did you say you said? Oh, so it's that he pulls kind of out the receipts. Mm-hmm. Yes, sometimes. I, I might like this couples therapy thing. I think that it's interesting. Well, we've had all sorts of convert- – Like, I, I think we've talked about this a lot and I, I think – we're both open to the concept and the notion, but yeah. in our world, we've had difficulties like who's the person, how do you find them, where do you go? Like, I think that's oh, the hardest yeah. thing. You find a to hooker that's She's also amazing. a therapist that can do both. Oh my God, I like that. I like that idea. <laughs> how old is your daughter? She's three. Three. We're in it. and uh, I we, can't believe you guys don't have a therapist. Old. Three and eight months. Uh, three and eight months. Guys, no. I know. You're being triggered left and right. Like how? Well, <laughs> how are you doing it? It's, it's not, I mean, it's a lot of work having two kids under three. That's crazy. People, I'm just, and I have help, so I can't yeah. even do, imagine. Do you know what though? This is I mean, actually a lot. Yeah. not a joke. We do this eight times a month yeah. and we've done it for so long. And I think in a way we get so much dialogue and conversation because it's not like just going to dinner. Like we right. sit with people like yourself and yes. sometimes doctors and sometimes th- yes. like we've had all sorts of therapists. I on think the show. couples therapy wouldn't hurt. A yeah. But I think you know what I mean? Try, like, yeah. I think if we didn't do something like this or we're talking where about you're connecting, it, then yeah. I think we for would sure. be in some trouble. For wow. sure. Wow. Yeah. What is your biggest parenting challenge? This was asked by the audience. Everyone wanted to know this one. My biggest challenge uh, is balancing like work and parenting. You've got a lot going it's on. It's really hard to wear the, the different hats. And honestly, for me to turn off work, to actually like put it aside and know that it, so the idea of something not being done drives me fucking crazy. And when you have a book, it's like, it's not done for a long time. And even after it's out, it's still not done. But um, it's hard to like get back into mom mode and be present in mom mode when like you're still spinning on work. So well, I think how do you, doing that. how do you, uh, I always ask writers this cause I'm so curious. How do you manage your day to get a book done? Is it something that you do an hour in the morning? Do you have like a schedule? Do you write when you feel compelled to write? When I was really in it, I mean, this last novel took me four years. So that was like a different beast altogether. But I was averaging a thousand words a day most of the time. And um, that I'd I'd start working at nine and I'd and I'd stop at five. I mean, I really was pushing. Wow. That's gnarly. It was I've never heard a writer say that long. That's a long day. And I'd get bored and you know, like force myself back in, but but I just don't like I don't like when stuff's like not done. 
So, I mean, that is crazy to write yeah. that long. That's it's a lot of It's weird right now because I don't have another book right now. And like to be floating and to, for the, this is like the first time since 2013, I don't have like this looming deadline over me. Um, and it feels, I feel very untethered at the moment. Well, you're probably getting content right now that you don't even know about for your next book. Yes. You know? Yes. Because I I'm feel like you're such a, a storyteller. And how do you, <laughs> how do you come up with what you want to write about? Like, well, the third book was, I knew it was going to be a novel because I knew I couldn't tell that story. Um, I couldn't tell that story as a memoir and like not burn a lot of bridges, but it was a story that I had to tell. And I felt like it was a story that I had, I needed to hear. So I needed to write it because I felt like I needed somebody to tell it to me. Um, but nobody wanted the book and it was like a horrible experience trying to sell it because go, pivoting from like memoir to fiction, especially like when you're kind of considered um, like in the celeb memoir space, mm -hmm. just nobody was taking me seriously. And I had editors pass that, you know, the second book I had a bidding war and the third book, it was like, I don't know if in a post COVID world, a book about wealthy white women in lower Manhattan doesn't read as tone deaf. And I just kept saying like, guys, this is real. <laughs> This is my truth. This is what's happening. And I know I can sell the fuck out of this book. Um, and so it was a full blown, like, you know, I don't know. It was an uphill battle. It was, it was not fun. Um, but you know, it felt good to, to sort of overcome and get it out into the world and, and have it be my best selling book. So what is it like being a woman in Manhattan with two children? Yes. What is that like? It was interesting. It's like, I don't know what it would have been like to be a mom in LA. I can't imagine being like, what are the differences? Parent. Do you think? Well, in LA, like the currency is fame, you know? So it's like, it's all about like, who was at my play date? What pilot are you working on? It's like, I felt like a doctor who lived at the hospital. I could never escape work. And because that's already hard for me, it was just like a terrible place for me to be. Uh, it's why we went to Texas, honestly, because like when we had kids or like yeah. that, I didn't want that to be the currency for our children. No, it's, it's so gross. It's, and I, and I mean, I have tons of friends there who are doing it and probably great at it. But for me, I could not do it. And in New York, I felt like, oh, I'm on a giant cruise ship where like I can be a mom upstairs, fully a mom, and then I can go downstairs and I can be a writer. I can be like, you know, of, of whatever the fuck you want to call me. Like I can get work done and I can be uh, having, uh, you know, still feel like a human being in the world and my identity hasn't just been like stripped of me. Also in LA, I feel like you're, you're kind of like, either banished to suburbia where you're just like in your house stuck with your kid or you're like at a studio or, you know, office somewhere writing all working all day and you don't see your child. So you can't have the same duality. And, and New York I felt was easier and more conducive for me in that way to just like get more done. Um, and I also think that New York, like nobody cares what you do in New York. Nobody gives a shit. Nobody cares. It's, it's, it's a, it's an opportunistic underlining tone in LA compared to New York. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's very well, different. I would, the way I describe it. But it is it. like powerful, like hardworking, hungry people, which I love. It's almost like, like the people who thought they were like the cutest in their high school went to LA and the people who are like the like the firstborn child who's like, I must succeed at all costs came to New York and is like, I'm going to found something. I'm going to like fucking hustle. I want to work. I want to make it happen. At least of our generation, like now this younger generation, I don't think anybody wants to work, <laughs> but I do believe that like, there's just a different mentality about think, like New York versus LA. Yeah. I, and, and again, like we California born and raised and have, yeah. still have an office in LA and all that. I think my issue, and this is not for everybody, but there is a large majority that it's more about what you do than who you are, right? And, and, and what like, you're doing in that moment. Yeah, and like, exactly. And so like when you describe yourself in LA or we found a lot of the time, it's like less about who you are as a person, what you yeah. believe, what you think. It's more about like you describe yourself by what you do. Completely. And I think that's a very difficult way to interact with humans and yes. also to raise children because I don't want to to teach 
at least our kids, that their worth is based on what they do. I mostly want it to be about who they are. No, it's, right. it's what yeah. you said is like you could be really multifaceted here. Like you can be all different kinds of things in yes. the same day. Yeah. Which is awesome. Like you, you upstairs, you're a mom. Downstairs, you're a writer. You go down the street, yeah. you're an art. Like just, yeah. you, you, you mix it up. It's a bag of tricks. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of liberating. I do not travel without my little detox drops and my beauty water. First of all, it comes in a set. It's by Saqqara. And it comes in like a matte black bottle and a matte white bottle. And the detox drops are chlorophyll and the beauty drops are like minerals. So what I do when I wake up is I make my water immediately. Lots of ice, lemon, mint, ginger. I mix it up and then I put my detox drops in there and my beauty water drops. And what I feel like this does is the chlorophyll is really good for blood circulation and energy. And then the minerals are just incredible for skin and for hair. And just it sets the tone of the day. I love, love, love this ritual that I've created. I've been doing this with Sakara for probably the last year and a half. It just is like a seamless, easy habit stack too. You have to try their detox drops and their beauty water. It's on their site. And then if you're looking for a delivery program that delivers real nutritious food, think plant-rich meals that are all about managing weight, easing bloat, keeping your energy levels high. Sakara has you covered. Sakara delivers science-backed, plant-rich nutritional programs and wellness essentials right to your door. You should also know they have a nutrition program that is absolutely incredible. It's like having a nutritionist and a chef in one. So basically, Sakara delivers science-backed, plant-rich nutritional programs. So basically, Sakara delivers science-backed, plant-rich nutrition programs and wellness essentials right to your door. Their ready-to-eat meals are nutritionally designed to deliver results from weight management to easing bloat to boosting energy and clearer skin. They really check all the boxes. Their products are absolutely beautiful and aesthetically pleasing. And right now, Sakara is offering our listeners 20% off your first order. So you're going to go to sakara.com slash skinny or enter code skinny at checkout. That's sakara, S-A-K-A-R-A dot com slash skinny. And you get 20% off your first order. Sakara.com slash skinny. I just got back from a trip and the whole trip I had a color palette. And one of the colors that I wore a lot was like a French blue. And how I got inspired by this color was through Jenny Kane. I got to pick a shirt off their site and I picked the boyfriend shirt. I got it oversized. So I got a large and then I wore their boyfriend shirt like over my bathing suit. It was so cute. It's a button up like a collared situation with a great sleeve. I love it oversized. And this color, you guys, is so pretty. It also comes in white and I'm not mad at the white, to be honest, and kind of like a mustard stripe. But the French blue is the move. It's on their site. It's luxurious. It's classic. It's comfortable. It's very California inspired. They also have like cotton and cashmere knit sweaters. I usually go to them for like elevated everyday basics. So if you're looking for a very classic minimalistic closet, this is it. But you have to go on and check out their boyfriend button up. It is so major for summer. I'm telling you. And of course, we have a code for you. Find your forever pieces at JennyKane.com. Our listeners get a discount. You get 15% off your first order when you use code skinny at checkout. And of course, we have a discount. Our listeners get 15% off your first order when you use code skinny at checkout. That's 15% off your first order. You're going to go to J-E-N-N-I-K-A-Y-N-E.com, promo code skinny. The brand go-to for all season staples. Treat yourself because you deserve it. It's gall. It's not gall. It's top gall. Okay. I recently heard about Top Golf through our cousin Leah. She raved about it and I had to get involved. So Top Golf is so cool. Here's the deal. They have clubs, balls, tees, turf and even a ball picker upper. It's like this little cart thing that picks up balls. They also have a whole bunch of stuff that's not golf. So they've really created a vibe there. So they have loud music, giant targets in their giant fairway, giant TVs and handcrafted food and also a beverage menu. This sounds like heaven. It sounds like a really good activity. And even if you don't consider yourself a golfer, I'm telling you, everyone can play just like you did. So you don't have to be a golfer to go here. You should also know they even have a whole day each week dedicated to more play for less play. So they do this thing on Tuesdays where the all gameplay is half priced. 
which gives players more of a reason to come play around. This is such a great activity for your whole team. If you have like a work team that you want to take out, have some fun, have a vibe, have an experience. Their handcrafted food menu is incredible. I personally love an experience, especially with Michael. And this is all about play and having fun. I am in to top golf. What a fun date night too. Definitely go check them out. Exclusions apply to the half price Tuesday promotion and full terms can be found at topgolf.com slash Tuesday. And most importantly, it's all about fun, which we love playing, eating, or just chilling. Go to topgolf.com slash Tuesday. It's liberating. And like when, you know, you're still trying to keep up with this, like, I don't know, idea that like women can have it all, which like, I don't really believe women can have it all, at least at the same time. New York gives you sort of a glimpse of like, maybe I could. There's this book that I (laughs) could do it all. I just, I just, maybe we need to move here. I just Mm -hmm. read it. And I think I was listening to you talk and I think you both might like it. It's called 4,000 Weeks. Uh-huh. Have you heard of it? Yes. And it's like, it, people think it's a productivity book, yeah. which in ways it is, but it basically points out that the most people only have 4,000 weeks on this planet, right? Yes. It's like when you look at your time span like that, uh-huh. the whole point is realizing that, to your point, you can't have it all. Like anytime you yeah. decide to do something, you're sacrificing something else yes. and you try to cram it all in and it makes us feel bad because yeah. we think that time is something to be used as a tool, but time is something right. that's actually working against us. Completely. And the whole point is you have to make sacrifices and make choices. Completely. Like it completely shifted the way I think about my relationship with time and getting things done and having yeah. it all. It's like once you realize and make peace, like you really can't have it all because you it's can't. not possible from no. a time perspective. Yeah. Then and as soon as that you accept that, you're like, oh, okay, like, then it's easier to make choices in life. I think so too. I fully believe that. That's so true. Because we all go through and I think we get discouraged because you say, I'm wasting time. I'm not being productive with my mm-hmm. time. I don't have like, yeah. and it's like this thing that's constantly working against you and we're trying to figure out the solve uh-huh. to basically own our time, but you can't. You can't. Right? And so you can't. it's interesting to think about because all of us are pr- trying to be productive people, yeah. but it's working against you. Fully. It's so annoying. Yeah, it's super annoying. How do you describe yourself? Like if someone's like there's I you do so many things. How how would you describe yourself at a cocktail party? I say that like I'm like a comedian and a writer. It's just sort of like I feel like vague enough. It no. sort of covers all the bases. I think that there's nothing more terrifying in my life than being a comedian. That is so much pressure to like to have to get I on think stage and make than, people laugh. Harder than anything. Harder than a musician. Yeah, is it just like, a stand up comic? I mean, that's a whole different thing. Yeah, but you 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 are very like on Instagram, I look at you as like a comedy account. Like it's that's so sweet. You're essentially you. standing on stage on Instagram when you're doing it. Yeah, it's the same thing. Or like when you're like hosting something, I feel like you are like, you have to really be ready. You have to be. Is that natural or you have to work at it? Um, No, I think that like, uh, it depends. I think it's just something that like you're either in the habit of doing or not doing. I think that like with the, with the, the comedy thing, it's like when I was on Twitter, I used to just like think in like a hundred and whatever many characters or less, it would just be like, that's a tweet. That's a tweet. That's a, you know, and, and you get good at it. And so it's, it's, um, you know, like anything, it's just when you're in practice it, with writing as well, it's like, I can get up to like 2000 words a day if I'm like doing it all the time. But when I get out of it, then it's like, Oh my God, I only made 800 words, you know? So it's just, yeah, the more you do it. I feel like people are thinking now in TikToks. Probably. Probably. And TikTok is still something that's hard for me. It's I mean, it's hard. It's it's not I a don't joke. I think it's like always and I'm like I have to do a dance. I have to be in a trend. <laughs> well, the problem is is like these things and the way that they're rewarding now is they're rewarding like more frequency, more abundance, more, yeah. more, more. Cause like, yes. you know, everybody knows like on social, these platforms aren't free because you're actually the product and you, yes. and you, as a writer, you get paid for your book. Right. Yeah. But on these platforms, you don't get paid anything and you're just feeding them content. They make yes, money. Right. Exactly. But it's like, now it's rewarding in the sense that like all it's doing is saying you have to do more. You have to do, oh, you only did two tweets. You got to do seven to get yep. seen. Right. And so it's exactly. like, it's just, you're in this thing and it just becomes, I, I think at some point you have to decide like 
where you're spending your time and energy. That's what I'm, I, but you know what? It's so hard to find somebody like I have gone through so many people looking for someone that wants to like work and do like social, like digital. Somebody that wants to work period. <laughs> for somebody that wants to work first of all, and like fucking doesn't ghost me after I'm like, Oh, let's have an interview. But, but just like that would help, you know, kind of like support the digital side of it because well, maybe it is a someone listening job. Will, wants to help. If, yes. if anyone's out there on TikTok, you're looking for on TikTok. Yeah. You guys, I mean, drop in Please, to your DMs. Guys, Seriously, I'm desperate. I'm Nobody curious. wants to do anything. I told Sid, I was like, I'm going to teach you how to edit. I'm going to buy you the nicest computer. And he's like, really? I said, yeah, but then you're going to work for me. <laughs> During COVID, we changed our policy in the company to like, okay, you, we're, it was obviously all work from home. Then after yeah. we came up, we're like, okay, three days a week, flexible. When I said, hey, we got to kind of get in here a little more because the world is like, we're back. It's up and yes. running. Yes. It was almost a revolt. It was an uproar. I'm like, listen, I cannot afford to run a business without anybody working. Like, we need to get in here and do Isn't this. Isn't it else, crazy? Or else we don't have a company. I'm like, look, I had yeah. to sit everyone down. I'm like, listen, we got a powwow about this. And they they're like, like, we've read 4,000 hours and fuck you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I'm like, listen, okay, well, the fast track this forward. In six months, we're all out of work. We have yeah. to, we actually have to come together and do something that creates right. a, you know, a valuable product or service to the world or else what are we all doing? I'm it's curious crazy. selfishly how you structure your time with everything that you have going on. Is there like a morning routine that you have, a nighttime routine, or do you just wake up and you're writing from nine to five and that's that? So I wake up, it depends on the day, you know, like if I know I have time to, like I was just writing this piece for Oprah. So like I have to write that piece, you know, and, and when I'm doing that, I become pretty like obsessive. And that's when it's like, I'll work out because, you know, I grew up with, you know, my parents are also like incredibly vain. <laughs> I grew up in a house where like, I didn't realize everyone didn't have to like go home and get on the treadmill after school. My God. <laughs> so like I do work out. That is something that like keeps me sane. Um, so I I work out. And then with the, the when I was writing the Oprah piece, it was like I'm just sitting there, like sitting at the computer until my kids come home writing. And Sylvia will come in and like <laughs> feed me something, spoon feed me. Uh, but then if I'm not on something, it's like I'll wake up, I'll go work out, I'll probably um, try to figure out jokes that I'm going to post that day, you know, write some shit. And then I don't know, go do a podcast, go, do, you know, kind of bop around like that. And then usually come back and like tinker with something that like, you know, a proposal for something. Out of all the content that you post on your Instagram, what d resonates the most that you see? Like, what are you, what are people like that's relatable out of everything you post? Because you do post a lot of relatable content, right especially now, to mothers. Yeah, right now it's funny. It's like I, because I came from Twitter where like you could like write and sort of. That's where you started Twitter. That's like really where like my writing career started was like, I was just like an angry actress married to someone more famous than me. And like the rage sort <laughs> of just like drove me to start doing comedy. Was there actual real rage that he was more famous than you? Yeah. Why? Because you wanted to be the fame. I, I, yeah. I, I, I was like, wait, oh, wait, no, oh, I, I get it. I get it. it. I'm like, you know was, I'm yeah. an overachiever and like, this cannot be I our dynamic. I hate if he I'm was not going to be the girl you, who takes your fucking cell phone photo with Jason Biggs. Did you guys start acting around the same time? Yeah. No, no. He's always like, Jenny, like whenever I'm like, why aren't you more motivated? You know, because I'm always like on him about like, you need to call your agents, you know, you know, because I'm a psychopath. And he's like, Jenny, I started working when I was five years old. I was on Broadway. Um, I've been working, what, 20 years longer than you. I'm good. Like, you know, I feel good about where I'm at in life. And I'm just like, still so hungry. So there's a different vibe between us. Do you know how when that like because we were so young when American Pie came out, but that was like, do you know how at the time how big of an uproar that was that kids were sneaking into that movie? Yeah, because yeah. that was like we were like twelve or thirteen when that came out. Oh, that's so funny. That's right, right. there in yeah, the Delmar Highlands. Are... Remember the Delmar Highlands? Yeah, the movie of course. Theater? That's where we would sneak in there. He was trying how to eat my funny. pie in American Pie. Oh my well, God. I think that's what <laughs> so got, funny. He gave me the idea. <laughs> Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the dynamic is that you are both, or is it both competitive or you're competitive? 
Well, he's competitive, but like not to the extent. He's like, what have I ever done to you? He's not support to, your career. He's not trying to beat. Give me. you money. Like, <laughs> give you children. Give you Fucking what <laughs> have I done? And I'm like, I bring can't. up the blowjob from the hooker. I would use that against him. See, I would do yeah. it, and then I'd be like, but you did get a blowjob from a. You hooker. did get a blowjob from See, a. Ho- I would yeah. fall for that trap. Where's I, my blowjob? I would turn a threesome down from Lauren because I think it's a trap. It's a trap. I, I that's think if funny. I say yes and act excited, it's not a that trap. It's a trap. It's not a trap. Yeah. See, that's that's a trap. Wait, that's a trap. So, that so when you like guys first yeah. started dating, you're saying people were coming up to you saying, "Can you take myself?" They'd be like, "Can you hold my baby so I can take a picture with Jason Biggs?" And so, what do you do? You're, you're horrified. Horrified. I didn't like it. I mean, you know, like I was 28 years old. I felt like I was. I, I feel like I had a lot going on. And then all of a sudden I'm with this guy that I'm fully eclipsed by. And it was maddening. It was really, it made me crazy. But was that part of the allure that like he was an accomplice, like at the, when you guys first met, like were you like, oh wow, he's an accomplice. He understands the space and the career. Mm, and my, uh, no. No. <laughs> I, no. I always wonder why. That was actors- the thing that like, that was the drawback to him because he's very maternal and like he really did. Um, he was so... He, we connect on so many levels, but the fame really, I had such a problem with it. It bothered me, except when I wanted to get into a good restaurant. Then I'm like, wait, you guys, you've seen American Pie, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I always, you know, because from an outside perspective, you see actors and actresses dating each other. And I always think, is that, I wonder, is that because it's relatable and they understand the world and they understand what it's like to be with somebody that is yeah. looked at? Like you walk into a restaurant, it's like, oh, there's the, there's the person, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, it's almost where uh, how do you say this in a nice way like if they're dating a normie they like the normie and I say like a normie yeah. who doesn't understand the world might like not be able to handle what you're describing right now which is like they're overshadowed by this person's fame or attention yes i mean i was with a writer for a long time before jason um and so he was also in the business so i i don't know i mean it wasn't uh, it was just more like an actor felt like direct competition, even though he's a man and like totally not my competition. <laughs> I would feel like but that. But I was like, you know, so the way I met him was that we, they gave me these audition tapes. I was auditioning for this movie and the, one of the guys was trying to sleep with my sister. So he said to me, do you want to see the tapes? Do you want to see the other girls you're up against? And like, when you get to like a certain level, whatever, there's only like a handful of us. I knew all of these girls and I was like, yeah, show me their fucking tapes. Let's see it. You know? And I'm sitting in my house, just like feeling so smug and powerful. And he's like, while you're at it, I want to show you the two guys we're choosing between. One is this guy, whoever it was. And the other guy is Jason Biggs. And instantly, like the hairs on the back of my, like back went up where I'm like, Jason Biggs, that guy from American Pie, like he, fuck him. He's famous. I'm not famous. Like give it to the underdog. Why would I want this guy to get more success in life? Like I was already pissed. <laughs> and then you the underdog. Exci- you weren't excited? Like, hey, this is the guy and I get to be, and I get to act? No, I was, because I didn't know I was cast yet. And I was still like, okay. Ew, no, I don't <laughs> give it to the other guy, that poor struggling actor. Like he deserves it. And then I watched the tapes and Jason was so good in this audition. I always tell him, I'm like, you were better in the audition than you even were when you did the movie. <laughs> and he hates that's hearing a, that. That's a, that's a dig too. Like he a- hates hearing that, but he really was so good. And I called Doug back and I was like, Doug, I think you have to give it to Jason. I didn't know he was so talented. I was a thespian, I was like a theater major, you know. I felt like very superior at this point in life. <laughs> and so <laughs> Oh, when I realized that he was actually, you know, not just this like whatever teen comedy sex guy, I was like, whoa, oh my God. Yeah. yeah. You got to give it to him. He's fucking talented. So then we ended up in Boston together for three months doing the movie. And then we were married six months after that. Did you like him in person right away romantically or did it take some pursuing? I'm always like, I wasn't like, I said, I remember saying to someone, I'm like, he's sweet. I mean, he's not the one, but yeah. <laughs> I remember saying that <laughs> to this other fucking director that I know. And I die over it because it is so funny. Pamela that- Anderson says the best thing. What is exactly she what you just said. She said, if you want a guy to marry you, be like, you're sweet, but we're never going to get married. I can't marry you. They oh fall in God. love. They That's fall in so love. so funny. Like, oh, you're sweet. You're not the one. 
Well, because it's a great it, it, way to start a relationship. I'm telling hilarious. you, because it just put checks them right into their well, place. It increases the, you know, the excitement so of the chase. Funny. You know? Yeah, that might be true. But I remember him also saying to me, like, after he's like chasing me, courting me, we're in Boston. He's like, I don't know if I'm ready to like be in a relationship. And I remember leaving because I had to go to Miami that weekend. And I was down there with another friend and I'm laughing. I'm like, can you believe that he doesn't think he wants to be in a relationship with me? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I'm the best thing this guy's ever going to get. <laughs> I was such a like bitch, but truly, I really, I don't know. I really believed it at the time. <laughs> so, so then your, your underlying resentment towards him being more famous than him, you get on Twitter and you're able to express it in a way that's like your own form of therapy. Yes. And then I realized I was funny because before that I was like, I was doing a lot of procedurals. I was always like a lawyer or a cop or, you know, an FBI agent or a ballistics missiles expert. <laughs> you didn't know you were funny since you and were little? No, I don't think I really understood that I was funny until okay. I started seeing people respond in that way. And then everything in my life changed. When so you, when you found out you, when you discovered you were funny, it clicked. And I really like s stepped into kind of like my voice, you know, I, for me, I think it was hard because I had dyslexia as a kid. So I felt like already I wasn't good enough. And then I was like this blonde little girl and it's like the eighties. And I definitely felt like nobody took me seriously. You see, you know, there was like very much this like dumb blonde stigma and I didn't feel like I was smart enough. I wasn't doing what the other kids could do scholastically. It was just like so upsetting. I remember like, you know, when it was reading time, I would be like taken out of class and I'd be with like these ESL kids from like, you know, like Iraqi refugees who were like learning to read. It was just like, I wasn't, I had to like really apply myself. And I think that that has become my superpower in a lot of ways because I have a resilience and like just like a drive that like I don't feel like I would have had had I not gone through that. And but you're I a do, writer now, which is so crazy. Yeah, because it's background. like my life is like built on like revenge. I'm like, <laughs> you know, fucking serve it to you guys. But like, I do think that because of those things, I had a real, just like I was, I, I would just avoid comedy because I didn't want to play the roles that I was getting in my twenties, which was like the ditzy blonde bimbo. And there was no way in hell I wanted anything to do with that. So I would just pass. I wouldn't even put myself in that situation as an actress. But when I started writing, it was just like, oh, oh this is who I am. And then it all changed. When I imagine then you can build your own audience on a platform that's not gate kept by producers, writers, directors. Oh yeah, and then agents. I had control over my life. And I was like, this yeah. is, why would anybody be an actor? Yeah, it really I I just it. finished um, Brave by Rose McGowan. Is uh -huh. that how you say her last name? I pronounce everything wrong. Yeah, Rose McGowan. Um, but I'm like reading this and I'm like, how is anyone subjecting themselves to, well, listen I that's her experience well, I think that's maybe just, her experience is different I'm just saying yeah I'm like how are you subjecting yourself to all of it's it's so many different layers well, that because you I have think, to get yes. through of, of people saying yes 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 yeah not it's to so comment true. on that you really particular can't, you don't have like you, you don't really have control over anything yeah I don't know yeah. her story so yeah. I'm not commenting fully but I think that's that's the dynamic that's changed so much with all these platforms is because there's no longer the person that says, yeah, you're in the part or you're not oh, in the yeah. part. It's like you can build your own attention if you have talent, right? And, totally. it, and, and it's not, and it's not dependent on like what a casting agent says or Completely. a director or a writer, or like maybe you piss somebody off and then they black, like this yeah. is like fully, like you can build attention for yourself if you have yes. the chance. Would you yes. ever go back to acting? No. <laughs> now, I like hate when I'm stuck somewhere. Like I get such, I did this like schoolhouse rock thing or I don't know, whatever recently with Jason and I'm, and I'm laughing to him because I'm always like, God, like how long are they going to keep us here? Because the idea of not being in control and having to like, just like kind of, I mean, an actor, you just have to sit on set until they can say you can leave. It's really hell. I hate it. I hate that feeling. It's also like stand on your mark, this light. And then Do I would again. And then you see your, <laughs> I, I would see myself and be like, oh, that angle. Like, yeah, like I just, just constant, like, I don't know. It seems like a lot of anxiety. Yeah. It's, it's like, I mean, for me, it's just more about, um, the lack of control. I'm like, why am I servicing somebody else's vision when like I have my own stories I want to tell? Right. Yeah. And it's funny because, you know, I, I watch what goes on, especially I mean, like, like cancel culture and all that stuff, but I watch what goes on there. And I'm like, the only reason you can really get canceled is because you've given somebody else or some other platform or some other gatekeeper control over your life. Like yeah. I always tell people all the time, yeah. like, 
we do whatever we want and say whatever we want on the show because like we don't answer to anyone. Like worst case is yes. maybe some advertiser doesn't want to work with us or somebody. Sure. But like basically like there's nobody that's making a decision of whether we can do this or not. When some of these other professions mm. is like, oh, you did that wrong thing, you're out. Like you see Completely. it with reality TV stars, right? Like they say the wrong thing on television and they're kicked yes. off the show. Completely. Like, oh no, I've I mean it's happened. I've seen it happen to Jason. It's crazy. Yeah, what like, do you I mean? would have to kick myself off my own show and I'm not going to do that, right? How right. has it happened to Jason? Just like during, um, this was like during the, this happened, you know, I mean, Twitter became like a very unsafe place to be for just everybody. <laughs> everybody. For everybody. Yeah. But like, um, you know, when the right, like some of these like right wing crazy, like twitchy and some of those sites started really trying to take down performers and writers and you watched it happen to James Gunn, who was like an incredible human being. And I mean, a lot of people, they just like came after people for like old past tweets. And um, this was right before Sid, or maybe Sid was born, I forget now, but, but Jason was on Ninja Turtles on Nickelodeon. And he made a tweet about um, Malaysian Airlines. And uh, it was like, the first plane went missing. And then we there was a report that the second plane went missing. Nobody knew anything, right? And I'm in the car with him. And and he wrote something, just a, a tweet that meant nothing. He just wrote, who wants to buy my Malaysian flight miles? You know, literally nothing. A joke. A joke. A fucking joke. The yeah. most innocuous, like not even a big, whatever. Cut to, maybe like a few hours later, that plane is found. It's like, the, you know, this fiery, destroyed, massive destruction, whatever, you know, it's just like this tragic plane crash and Michelle Malkin and a few of these other people, all of a sudden on everywhere, TV, like Fox News everywhere, you see Jason's face with a flaming plane next to it. Like as if like, oh. how, you know, heartless can these left wing actors be, you know, and fully, I mean, like he, he Viacom fired him. He lost Ninja Turtles. It, it was just like horrible. So like at that point, it became like, okay, we got to like shift. We got to, we have, it's not, we can't be putting ourselves in those kinds of positions anymore. It's just like not worth it. But you know, it's funny. I think I, now I think like years, like, cause we saw all this and I, like we were ardently outspoken about how absurd a lot of this was. And especially yeah. because things that were maybe not considered offensive four years ago started surfacing oh, and then God, were considered offensive. Totally. Right? I like, did delete everything. There were things, horrible <laughs> things. I mean, I used to live tweet The Bachelor. Yeah, there's Imagine a, me post Me Too movement, how those tweets would read now. No, sure. But this is the problem. It's like, <laughs> And Bill Burr has the funniest thing about this. He was talking about how people were like digging up things John Wayne said. And we're like, John Wayne has been dead for 50 years. Right. He's gone. And like the, the fact that as a society, we're sitting here focusing on something yes. like that in the past and not focusing on how to like move forward in a better way for right. the future. It's just absurd. But it's, you know, it's it's not productive for anyone. Yeah, and I think no. all it's done for people is just made people more guarded and more um, – or more or less likely to share how they really feel about this things. is what it's like. Oh, it's, it's, like, it's so it's yeah. like having an intimate dinner party at your house where you have all your friends there and you're all talking normally and you're drinking and you're having happy hour and you're having fun. And then one of the friends goes and tells another friend that's outside the dinner party, your whole conversation. That friend is not invited back to dinner with you. Right. So with, with what happened with Twitter, it's like, if you can't put your opinions on Twitter, then you just maybe don't get access anymore because people yeah. freak out. Listen, my exactly. grandmother is a yeah. 96 year old, fully Japanese woman. You wouldn't look know that from looking at me. I'm a quarter, but she's fully Japanese. Some of the things that I've heard her say out of her 96 year old Japanese sure. is absurd. And you could, and honestly, maybe doesn't work, but I'm not going to say and villainize my 96 year old grandmother who grew up literally almost 100 years ago in a different right. world. It's like, this is right. how it is. We got to allow some grace here. We got to be right. like, listen, you know, not everyone's going to be perfect. So did you right. delete your Twitter after this happened with Ninja Turtles? I deleted a little bit after that, but after like Trump came into office, I was like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm out. I'm yeah. out. Uh, but Jason, it's like, you know, I remember saying to him, like, I want you to say something. You need to say something about the Roe, you know, the Roe versus Wade stuff. I want, I want you to say something about abortion. You know, just, I felt like not enough men were saying something. And he's like, Jenny, I love you, but like, I have so much like PTSD around this issue like, I can't, I don't want to, like, get, I, I just can't be, I can't be doing that. 
it's just not healthy for me. And I, and I totally respect that because it's like, again, this is like an actor who literally had something like stripped from him that like, of course kills when you have two sons who love Ninja Turtles. It's like such a, it's so, it's just all sad. Well, the, the sad so, thing is now. I don't know. I mean, for like a, just a tweet that was like nothing. The sad thing is on that on, uh, that, on him speaking out, he's, he would have honestly been damned if he did, damned if he didn't. And like, that's what was, he said to me. He's like, no I'm going to get shit either way. There's no way that goes well. Yeah, and I think that's the yeah. sad commentary on the society we live in now where it's like it's so – there's no room for nuance in conversation. At it's all. like pick your side of the line, right? Yes. And if you're not on the – like – and we talk about this all the time. It's like I try to I try to meet people and think that – when you meet me, you you may not know every side of every issue I stand on. I want yeah. to basically form my own opinions, and I and I think yeah. it would be a failure of thought for myself personally to define myself along party lines. I really uh -huh. want to hear and understand uh -huh. why somebody thinks the way they think, yes. and then come to my own informed conclusion, which is how we used to do things, right? It's how we used to think. Exactly. But now, and I've heard you know you hear this all the time, like you have to pick a side, you have to take a stance. It's like, well, right. I, I don't know. I don't understand. I'm actually not that informed about everything. Right. right. I have to, th right. I have to think for a second and I can't just jump into the Twitter bandwagon b based on, I know. Right. It's hard. It's And yeah. nobody, and, and I think the nuance is people should say that more and be like, Hey, maybe I actually don't know yes. enough to comment yet. Um, right. I think that I feel a certain way, but I got to do a little research before I like write a soliloquy yeah. online. It, it's scary. It's just dangerous. Yeah. I think that, that there's a way to not show every single part of yourself online and keep some private. There has yeah. to be an element of privacy. It, yeah. For me, at least. Like, I have to have my own thoughts and feelings. I can't share every single thing. Yeah. So yeah. I get I get. And listen, not from. to take anything yeah. away from I actors mean, or yeah. podcasters, but are we really the best people to comment on yeah, very I mean, I mean, complex on. issues right when it pops off? Like, I don't know what's going on with <laughs> right, the trade right, embargoes. Right. I have right. no fucking clue. But there's right? also like comedies, just like not safe to be funny. Like that really bums me out. It's no. like, it's such a shame that you know, even things, some, sometimes I'll say things that people are like, you're horrible. How dare you? And it's just like, Girl with no job did the funniest TikTok. There was this, there was like this girl that's doing content and she's like, she's like, um, this is my like LED light mask. And I know everyone can't afford this LED light mask, but this yeah. is the one that I like. And then it like goes to girl with no job. And she's like, are we really having to preface everything yeah. to like make everyone to comfortable? make everybody feel and comfortable. And it's so true. I even like will say things like to yeah. preface it, pre to preface it. Yeah. It's like, not everyone's going to feel comfortable all the time. Right. That's called life. Yeah, totally. Anyway. Well, it's like you want the real Have details. you guys seen Chris Rock's new special? It's Michael has. Really I haven't seen it. So good. Yeah, with selective <laughs> outrage. I was dead over some of the things he was saying. Yeah, he went on on Will Smith at the end there. That was, that was wild. His Did you see the end? Oh, I'm literally like. Don't I've tell like, her. No, I have like oh. three minutes left. Oh, 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 you're going to see the end. I mean, yeah. I I'm, mean, Chris Rock but is... But I'm dying over the, like, the women's, like, abortion stuff. <laughs> like, I even heard it. <laughs> dying. Yeah, it's... It, well, I mean, like... And what again, like, this... What I think comedians do, especially stand-ups, in such a great way, is they are able to actually take very serious and complex issues. Yeah. And then call out the absurdities in the way we view yes. those issues, right? And they're yes. a way to do... And, and a guy like Chris Rock or Dave Chappelle, like, they're masters at taking very complex yes. issues and kind of making us look at ourselves in the way that we're talking about those issues. Yeah. Like, okay, like you got to be able to laugh in life. If you can't laugh in if life. You can't you laugh. Exactly. It's like, can we just like laugh and not like take everything so serious? I think it's going to swing. I love when guys like yeah, Chris Rock be behind come back the, too. Get, get behind Twitter, get all your content, put it in your notes app. Cause it's going to swing. And I can say whatever the fuck I want again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh what God, I like I about yeah. guys like Chris Rock or Dave Chappelle when they as they're older now, because yeah. you know the comedy from when they're younger. Right. It's like a more mature take on life, but it's yes. still like they're so fucking funny. So, so tell funny. us about your book. Which book? I, oh I know which I'm book. Traumatized. Well, give, which us, book? give us a little give us a little breakdown of each one because I'm a big fan and I think that our audience will especially love your books. Give us a breakdown of each one. So I like you just the way I am was my first book. And that's just like a lot of like capers. It's sort of like a really fucked up, a dark, I love Lucy. Yeah. And I get into a lot of hijinks. That one has like the hooker story in it. There's a story where like, again, like would this play today? Like I sent my sister an anonymous note telling her she was molested by my grandfather. Oh my like, God. I don't know that that plays today guys, but at the time it was hilarious. Um, there's a lot of stuff in that book. Actually, one of the other things 
again. I can't even, it's just, it's too crazy. But I had like a, I had a run in with Jason's ex who I was obsessed with. She's. Who's the ex? Just this random girl, but she's literally Moby Dick and I'm Captain Ahab. And of course, the last time I finally saw her again, she's no on the island of Nantucket. It was just like the fuck, it just writes itself, guys. But uh, there's a lot about me stalking her in this book. In she's the first a known book. person or a not, not a known person? Not a known person, a person. but okay. she was, I was absolutely obsessed with her. I would like gift her things of hers I'd find around the house, go on hikes with her for running, on running Canyon behind Jason's back. Like basically was having a relationship with her behind Jason's back when we first got together. Um, I think a lot of girls do that. I set her up with my acting coach and then I went on the date with them. There was just like a lot. Oh, so, are you guys friends still? No, she doesn't speak to me and I've made amends many times and I did promise I'd never talk about her again. Oh. But like, <laughs> so I'm just gonna go quickly through it. It's in that book. There's a lot with her. Um, and then book two, Live Fast, Die Hot, is about when I had Sid and then all the craziness that ensued and sort of this idea of like, how can I be the mom I always wanted when I didn't have the mom I always wanted? Like, what can I do to like equip me? Like, how can I better prepare myself? So it's like, I got in a fight with this guy on Etsy and then I like went to Morocco to like the Atlas Mountains to meet the women that actually wove the rug. Um, I went to Peru and did ayahuasca with Chelsea Handler. That chapter's in there. Um, I moved to New York like because I became convinced that our house was haunted in LA. And now I'm so pissed because why did I not call that chapter by ghostal? <laughs> like why? I just thought of it the other day and I'm so pissed. Actually, my friend Mike was like, it's by ghostal. That's I was like, a tweet. Mike, by ghostal. That's a tweet. But I down. was like, yeah, convinced the house was haunted. I follow the people who own the house now on, on Instagram. Just see if they're okay. Well, I'm pissed because nothing seems to have happened to them. It's like really annoying. Maybe something will. I keep waiting. Yeah. I also Are don't like how they decorate. Hopefully, Hopefully it's to... the producers of Ninja Turtles. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then this, th and the third book was the novel City of Likes, which is like about you know a new a young mom of two living in Manhattan who falls under the influence of, un under the spell of like a you know a very prominent mommy influencer. It's kind of like Heather's meets Mean Girls in Lower Manhattan. Um, there's some really like fucked up shit that happens. How true is this book? A lot of it is based on fact. <laughs> a lot of it. How much is a lot of it? I would say that the stuff that people think is fake is usually the true stuff in all of my books. What's something like so outlandish that it like a hook to get us all to go get the book? Like something that will just be like jaw on the floor. Oh my God. Well, I can't give it away, but like there is like somebody who gets like mowed down by an Uber, like an Uber in the like first. Yeah. It, it gets, it goes, gets crazy. It gets dark. And this is the one that you were going to burn bridges with if you made it. Yes. Like memoir. Yes. And yes. Cause I just call out a lot of people that, that if you are on Instagram and in that like mom space, you'll recognize these people. So that's why I was like, this is not a good idea for me. So wait, you don't think it's going to burn the bridges by people? No, because she didn't say well, it. Well, it's fiction. Yeah, it's oh, fiction, okay, Michael. Okay, it's okay, fiction. Right, right, right. And, and then what, Dictator yeah, Lunches yeah, is the, the, the book, which is like, you know, teaching moms like how to basically curate lunch. Because I don't consider myself a chef. I'm just like curating. It's like, what do I have in the fridge that's left over? What can I throw together to make, you know, a healthy, fun engaging meal for my kid. Cause I just believe that like the more we dumb down food for kids, like the more like dumb food they're going to eat. Like there shouldn't be, I don't know why in this country there's a kid's menu. It's like, why am I having a salad with a salmon? And then I'm like throwing nuggets at you. Like you're like some sort of animal on the floor, but I expect you to grow into like a civilized human being who can like use a fork and knife. It I've doesn't make sense. That. That's actually a good point. It's so true. And you know what? I bet you, I'm just going to guess there's not a lot of kids menus in Europe, right? At all. Yeah. No, in Europe, I'm in Europe like three times a year with my kids and they're like, you're eating what I'm eating. There's no choice. They're like, I'll have the caviar with a side of pate. It's like oh my a God. Well, they're just thing. like, yeah, they're like, here's the, your like fucking schnitzel and <laughs> spetzel and you're good with it. Yeah. Jenny, you're amazing. You can come back anytime. I oh, can talk to you about you. 600 things. Where can everyone find you, your book, Pimp Yourself Out? I'm on Instagram still trying to segue off into something else, but I'm Jenny Mullen on Instagram and um, JennyMullen.com has like all the link trees that lead to all the things. Never going back to Twitter. 
I'm you, on Twitter. You could like see me on Twitter. Even with but, the new shakeups going on, Twitter's wild lately. I don't God, Twitter's there. like even freakier now. Who I knows? Got re, I got re-engaging on. I started re because they just got so wild there with all this stuff going on. It is fun now to like spy. Yeah, there's a it's lot true. going on. There is a lot happening. There's nothing off limits is on Twitter anymore. It's just it's all out there. It's just like wild west. Yeah. Maybe you should get back on. I I may need to reintroduce or TikTok. I'm on TikTok, but I don't know how to work it exactly. That's okay. I'm like a grandma, like who's driving, but she's like probably should have her license revoked. That's me on TikTok. Jenny, thank you for coming on. You Thanks guys for definitely me. go That's check fun. out her books. I'm obsessed. <laughs>